You're watching Diecast Breakdown with Chuck Ellis, David Johns, and Mark McHotwheel. So sit back, strap in, and hang on. The breakdown starts now. Hey there, folks. Chuck here, and welcome to Diecast Breakdown, a very special episode indeed. Today, I am joined by my co-hosts, Mr. David Johns. Hey, Chuck. I'm ready. And Mr. Mark McGowell. How are we doing, Mark? Good. How's it going, folks? And we are so excited about this chat today. But before we get started, I want to thank our executive producer level patrons. That would be Donald Rashik. First and 64th Customs of Video Geek Productions, and of course, Mr. Twice Diecast. Thank you all for supporting the show, and thank you to all the folks who contribute, whether they click the join button or join us on our Patreon and buy the merch, share the episodes, especially those that share the episodes. Thank you so much for spreading the word, and uh, we're uh, excited to share the word today because we got Mr. Larry Wood himself in the studio, the godfather of Hot Wheels, as they call him. Larry, how you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. The sun's out, working on my cars every day, so I'm I'm happy. Oh, that is fantastic. Awesome. And we're going to be talking about those again real soon. But uh but first before we get started, just wanted to to see what you're what are you up to these days? We know you're uh, enjoying your retirement when you say you're working on your cars, what are you working on? Oh, I've got a 54 Jaguar with an LS in it. I've got a Ooh, uh, Model right. A with a Miata uh, motor. I've got a 32 Nash with a big block in it. I've got a <laughs> 51 Woody with a LS in it. And I've got a 33 Ford with a 302 motor. And I got a 34 Ford Vicky that I'm just wor- starting to work on. So I got my hands full. It rattled them off right off the top. Yeah, yeah. Wow. That doesn't They're... include the daily drivers that I got to keep maintenance up on. Yeah. There's a there's a lot more in the Elwood garage than uh, than I thought, and and I, I've got to say I I'm going to be the one to raise my hand and admit I was sitting there going Elwood Elwood why oh oh I said it out loud and then I was like oh, I get it now very clever Elwood garage so it's uh it's the way I sign my drawings yeah Elwood, mm-hmm. Elwood. yeah mm-hmm. and I, I you, you you don't want to put the whole name out there or you just yeah no it's Andy. Well, I mean, you, you've already learned about putting your phone number out there, so you might not might as well keep the the name short. So, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I heard you still actually have that phone number. Is that yeah, true? Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> People, if you don't know, look up the story be about the about the uh, tow truck with uh, Larry's phone number on it, and uh, please do not call that number. Give Larry no. a break. I don't, hey, Larry. Phone, I don't answer that phone anymore anyway. It's all cell <laughs> phone anyway. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Hey, La- hey, Larry, I read also that for every one-to-one scale, there is a 164 scale as well in in a Hot Wheel. Is that still true with everything in the garage? I try to do that. Of course, ever since I've been retired, I've gotten a few cars that, it, that I didn't get a chance to do one-on-one. But I think mm-hmm. I've got about probably eight to ten real cars compared to the Hot Wheel. Well, maybe maybe a couple people back that still uh, might 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 throw you a bone and then get that cast know, out for you. Don't even know my name anymore. Oh, come on! Oh, yeah. come on! <laughs> so uh, I'm curious no. as somebody who's uh, Mark and I especially have done a lot of work on cars. I I restored my car in my garage, uh, did a rotisserie rebuild on it, which was a, a huge pain. Took six years because I didn't know what I was doing. What's your favorite part about working on a full size car? Fabricating. Okay. Um, I hate painting. I don't do painting. I don't do body work. I always send that out. Um, Mm -hmm. But fabricating brackets and welding, making things. And uh, today I was uh, doing some of the top on the Model A and it's all wood. So I was cutting wood and fitting it and and screwing it together, making little brackets and everything to make it all hold together. So that's what I like to do. I like to create. It's just like drawing. You're just making things in 3D. That's all. Yeah, I learned uh, when I was taking my welding classes, basically, they were like, if you can make it in paper, you can make it in metal. You just got to figure out how to fold it, get the angles right, do the mock-up. We would take cereal boxes when we were doing the the body work on my Valiant and uh, curve it to fit, do the lineup, and then get the shrinker stretchers out and (laughs) go nuts. Uh, it's so cool that you have this love of the big cars that you had before you started with the little ones, but you didn't really start 
as a car guy. Like I, I, I'm always fascinated because if you think about it, the die cast car thing is a relatively new toy when you think about the the vast stretch of toys out there. And so so folks of uh, of your generation didn't really grow up playing with toy cars like that wasn't really a thing. So when you when you got out to California and you see these kids playing with cars like what what's that initial reaction? What was that that thing when you're like, what is, what is this orange track? What are these these cars? Well, I, I don't know if you know the story, but I was invited to a party of a buddy of mine, and um, we went to his party, and and he, I walked into the into this back room, and his kids were playing with this orange track and these little cars, and mm-hmm. my kid was just like six months old, so I didn't know anything about them, mm-hmm. and I said, hey, these are cool. What the heck are these things? I looked at them, and because uh, Harry Bradley and and Ira had already done some pretty neat stuff. And uh, Howard Reese was the it was it was his party, and he was he says, "Well, I'm the designer of Hot Wheels, but I'm not a car guy. I'd rather do something else." Well, mm-hmm. guess what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I replace you. So he yeah he went right in and said, "I got a guy to replace me." And uh, I came in and did the interview, and I was working a mm-hmm. week later. Now this is after the Art Center when you were at the Art Center. Yeah, right? Art Center. Then uh, then uh, Ford for a couple of years. And mm-hmm. then Lockheed Aircraft uh, interiors for a couple of years, uh, just mm-hmm. a job to get me to California. So, mm-hmm. so got, what are we doing? What, what are we doing? We got, here? got a got a photo bomb. Oh, hey, there he is. Who's this? This is Fluffy. He just stopped <laughs> by to say hi. I actually just put my cat in the other room because he likes to do the same thing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you you have this really interesting history because you you did design, you did car stuff. And you're working on parts and stuff in Detroit, and then you're working on the L1011 as well. Uh, So I'm always fascinated by people when they're in those stages of the careers. Like, what's it feel like when you're you're working on these and you're going, hey, is this what I'm going to gonna do? Is is this as far as it's going to go? Like, what what is it like? to be in that moment and then realize it's time to make that leap and put yourself out there. Well, obviously being wanting to be a car designer since I was a little kid, when I finally got to Detroit and was a car designer, it Mm. was the ultimate. It was great. I was in the studio and the full size 69 Mach one was in there and clay and the the Mm. Torino's and the, I saw the Ford GT and I was just fabulous, really neat. And, um, it, it really wasn't the the even the job. Even though you didn't get to do a full size car, you do it a tail light, you did a hood scoop, you did mm-hmm. a few things like that. And uh, I liked interiors because interiors was a little little freer. You got to do a, some dash panels and you got to do some seats and some mm-hmm. things that were not quite as. In other words, the guys that have been there for a while, they wanted to do the car body, and mm-hmm. they deserve it because they had worked there for ten or fifteen years, and I'm only there for a couple months. So, but it was great. I just had a good time and i had room, room to two guys and we just partied our brains out you're talking <laughs> to this man we were just great detroit was a fabulous party. detroit rock city oh, yeah. oh i tell you we would go to all the girls uh, colleges and put up flyers for our parties because we knew if the girls showed up the guys would show up <laughs> oh absolutely uh, yeah. oh we were we were notorious i mean every cop in the uh, in detroit knew of our parties <laughs> so uh, it, it was a good time you're at the age where you better do it then because you're not going to do it when you're 80 so exactly uh, it was lots and lots of good times back then yeah and and just like the the car scene in general at that time the woodward and just oh. cruising there Oh, yeah. I can't imagine what it was just all the, the, the Chrome and the, the scoops and the angles and all the rumbling engines. It must've been just uh, yeah. horse intoxicating. Power, yeah. Horsepower yeah. And, and style was, it was a perfect thing. The sixties and seven was just getting uh, the horsepower stuff. And like I say, Woodward Avenue, I'd cruise that on the weekends mm-hmm. all the time in Corvette. So uh, yeah, it was perfect. Be back with more Diecast Breakdown after this word from our sponsors. The day of giving has come and gone, but the Diecast season of giving continues. We're halfway to reaching our goal of donating 20,000 cars around the world to kids in need. All you need are brand new and packaged Diecast cars and a local charity of your choosing to join in. Help us put smiles on the faces that need it most. Learn how you can join in and submit your donation to be counted at DrivenDreams.org. Let's end the year strong.
Hey everybody, this is Jovita from the SRT Jovita Show, and you are watching Diecast Breakdown. Here's this week's small channel shout out. Jesse's Diecast Garage. If you have a favorite Diecast channel with less than 700 subscribers, and you'd like to see them highlighted on a future episode, email us at diecastbreakdown at gmail.com. The Diecast Media Network Store is here. Wear your passion with pride. Featuring designs from Diecast Breakdown, Flying Valiant Builds, plus unique designs inspired by Diecast culture from Justin Ellis. Visit tpublic.com slash Diecast Media Network now. Hey, this is Chad Reed from Round 2, and you're watching Diecast Breakdown. And now back to Diecast Breakdown. But in talking about the older cars, what do you what are your thoughts on some of the, I mean, straying away from, from Diecast, even though, because it's all related, but the full, the one-on-one cars, some of the new stuff, like, what do you think of some of the new designs that are coming out with the actual manufacturers compared to some of the older stuff? Because I'm, I was born in 84, so I never really got to experience some of the older stuff. Of course, I gravitate towards some of the older stuff with Japanese cars and what I own. What do you, what do you see um, with some of the newer stuff that's coming out with design and, and what are your thoughts like on you? Are you really excited about some of that stuff or is it kind of kind of the opposite for you? What are your thoughts on that? Well, as, as a professional designer, when you see the um, Teslas and some of the I just saw an Audi the other day, a four door Audi that was just knocked my socks off. And this mm-hmm. is gorgeous stuff. Yeah, uh, it's funny because when we were designing back then, Big, you had to use headlights. The windshield angle had to be so and so. You had to be, be able to wear a hat in the car, and so the the cars were tall and, and kind of fat, and nobody cared about handling or anything like that. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, a, a Tesla is probably the perfect shape of a car. I don't agree with the front end, but I mean, yeah. even now, I can see a couple year old Tesla and going, "Wow, how are you going to design something better than that?" And but you got to admit, a lot of the cars are copying the Tesla. I mean, I see mm-hmm. all. A car now has has the flush door handle that pops open like the Tesla has. And, uh, of course, with electric cars, now you're starting to have some fun with uh, some new designs and the new front ends. I'm not saying anybody has got the answer yet. Some of those front ends are pretty ugly on some of these electric mm. cars. But uh, they're using the, the the lights all the way across the front. I mean, you can out here, there's probably six Teslas at every stoplight. You know, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Mm. I, in fact, the other day I went to a doctor's appointment just for something to do. I counted Teslas. I counted twenty-four Teslas just on the way Get out of here office. So it's uh, it's unbelievable. It's the best-selling car out here. Um, but there's starting to be some pretty pretty ne- neat stuff going on. Like I say, I'm I'm not a fan of some of it. But and then of course the SUVs. How would you like to be a designer in Detroit and you have to go buy a, you know you have to buy a box that six people have to fit in. There's no aerodynamics. It's back to the windshield angle and the height and everything else. And some of those guys are doing a pretty good job at it. But as being a designer, boy, that would be a, that'd be a not a very good job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The you outline know. is there. The one thing good about it is uh, they're spending a lot of time on taillights. I love to look at some of the taillights mm-hmm. these days. You get out behind yeah, a car and tell some guy had a job for a year, six months. And his job was to do the taillights on the Lexus. Yeah, it's, it's like a light show for some of them. Oh, you know, unbelievable. Like, mm-hmm. But some of them are pretty neat. So at least it's got that rather than just a round taillight with a one bulb in it. I worked for Lexus for probably 12 years or so. So Lexus has really been one of my favorite car brands oh, yeah. when it comes to design. Yeah. Um, even their LS or their uh, LC 500 car that they came out with the last few years. Um, they had to design a headlight that could pretty much fit in the palm of your hand because of all the other. And then they had the the hood that has, it had to, it, the car so low profile that if you hit someone or a deer, that the hood has charges and it has to pop up and it has to pop the person or the deer or whatever yeah, up exactly. so they don't go over the car and hit the next car. <laughs> so it's been pretty cool being able to work for them and stuff. But like, I know that my I've got a 12, 2012 GTR and I know that uh, they were they had the flush handles back in 09. So I know that they were probably one of those first first ones out that you had to push the handle in and and grab it and then tesla kind of made uh an automatic version of it and stuff like that so yeah it's pretty pretty interesting to see some of the new stuff but it's yeah the old stuff really i love some of the new stuff but the old stuff is 
I'm definitely not as safe. Like when I'm sitting in my 69, 510, I don't feel sure. that safe. I mean, I've, I've watched the old videos of cars like flipping over on the Nürburgring when they're, the doors yeah. are flying open and the windows are falling out and stuff. Yeah. And nowadays they're, they're not made. People say, yeah, they don't make them like they used to. They're, they're a lot. There's a reason though. I have a, I have. I have a steel dashboard in my Valiant. Yep. It is just a steel dashboard, and uh, I am I am if I'm not impaled by the steering wheel, my my or my passenger's head is going straight into that steel dashboard. So I uh, <laughs> safe yeah. thirty four Ford with the yeah. with the yeah. dash right there and the windshield right yeah, there. And exactly. The cool thing about that is at sixty five miles an hour, you're happy. You're you're you're. You, you feel like you're doing a hundred. Yeah. yeah. So there's, yeah. there's to, nothing like slow car fast. Exactly. It feels great going down the freeway. I'm not in the fast lane with my hot rods. I'm over a couple lanes over just putting along, having a good time and yeah. people are honking. I'm waving and, and just, oh, I'm fine with that. I, I it'll run a hundred. No problem. But I don't, it's not the kind of car you want to do that with. You want to just putt along. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's all about those smiles per gallon. As Amen. We say exactly. No, that's why I, I'm perfectly happy with having slant sixes in my cars. They they look they look good. I've got a rat rod style pickup. I've got this beautiful blue Valiant that we built, and uh, we get tons of smiles, tons of waves, and uh, we have a good time. And it starts every time I turn the key. That's, and you can uh, fix it with a wrench. That's the dream. Yeah, I've got a I've got a tool set in the trunk that does everything I need, and I got a couple belts just in case something goes wrong. Yep. Uh, the thirty four Ford I'm working on now, I carry a hammer to hit this carburetor. So there you go, up. Henry. Henry, he had to figure it out, man. Yeah, there, <laughs> there you go. go. Hey, hey, Larry, have you uh, you ever thought about a world without Hot Wheels? Uh, as I as I was thinking about this interview, and here let me let me preface it with this, and, and I'll get your thoughts on this. When we think of Hot Wheels, we think the best-selling toy of all time. But it it wasn't always such a sure thing that it was going to be such a monster hit, was it? Oh, there were some pretty lean times. And and I'm just curious, if if you hadn't been the guy at the, sh- the captaining the ship at that time, uh, did you ever think that maybe this isn't going to work out at Hot Wheels? Oh, like the Hot oh. Wheels aren't going to work out? Oh, are you kidding? Um, of course, 72 was when Mattel got in trouble with the stock market. And uh, they laid off over 50% of the people. I was the only guy mm-hmm. on the floor for a while. I could drive my car into the parking lot and park on the in the executive parking lot when there usually was never a parking spot there. There was yeah. a for sale sign on the building. Um, they actually told us there wasn't enough money we had to go to the bank the minute we got our paycheck because there wasn't enough money to pay yeah, everybody. You better beat the next guy. Exactly. So uh, I went out and interviewed with a few, a few people. I was that was it was all over as far as I was concerned. And um, Hot Wheels wasn't doing all that good back in the seventies. The enamel cars and they took the the decal, the red lines off and things like that, trying to cheapen things up. And um, yeah, it was close, and, and of course, Barbie was the same thing. It was the the girls were were gone too, and luckily somebody was smart enough to say, "Wait a minute, there's a good company here. Let's put somebody in charge that knows what they're doing." And um, we survived for a couple of years, but I think I only did four or five cars a year, uh, a year that year, so there wasn't much to do. I used to set up track in the whole floor and i had superchargers all the way around the room and i could put a yeah. car on the track and you know, like 10 minutes later he'd come flying by and <laughs> put another one on what the heck i had nothing else to do i didn't even have to go into work there was nobody there to look at me my in fact my boss laid uh laid everybody in our department off and then he came back a few minutes later and said well they laid me off <laughs> so wow. I was the guy there and then, and then to think about where it's at right now i mean that's got that's got to just flabbergast you right thinking back to those days yeah the 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 changing point was when people that played with hot wheels had kids like 20 years into it they would go to the store and buy a couple hot wheels for their kids but they'd buy a couple for themselves heck yeah they would sudden our sales started to pick up and double up and um Mike Strauss showed up one day at uh, at Mattel and said, I want to do a book on values and uh, the story of Mattel and blah, blah, blah. And Mattel didn't care. They said, just talk with Larry Wood. He'll tell you anything you want to know. So we got together and we started putting out this book of the values and the stories of Hot Wheels and everything. And right about then, things started to 
pick up and slowly, but again, it, I was there for, you know, what, 20 years by myself. Mm. And it wasn't until that 18th year or so that the things all of a sudden got to the point where, hey, they're doing, a, we're doing pretty good here. We better hire a couple other people mm-hmm. to, to work with me. So, yeah, w- unbelievable. There was no way in hell this was ever going to happen. Larry, on behalf of everybody on this planet, thank you for not giving up. No, it was, that was, it was my, passion right? about that time it was it was more than just a little toy it was something it was i was making the product and i was doing the pr and i was doing everything else so it was all all my passion that kept me going it's so cool to think about it and just like i mean i'm sure in the moment it was very much not cool i'm sure it's like you're looking over your shoulder every day going i'm the only person in here when somebody gonna tap me on the shoulder and go hey uh you know we're out here I'm and done. uh but you know, in that moment, when you're when you're doing that and you're going, OK, I've got like four or five cars to design this year or I can do 10 this year. What's the process that you would go through when you were deciding what those cars would be? There were times, mostly in the beginning, that we would put pictures on the walls, pick a grill from this or pick a theme from that and, and do things to uh, try to figure out what car we were going to do. Um, a few years later, Mattel, like I say, Hot Wheels was was dropping down. Mattel was in trouble. Nobody cared. Nobody, mm. nobody even knew I was there. I was just sitting back in the corner, you know, with a couple a couple drawings and trying to come up with a car for to do. And uh, we didn't do a lot of tampo back then, so I didn't have graphics to do either. I did a lot of sets, and I actually did a couple Barbie things. I did the Barbie Corvette and the Barbie Ferrari, uh, mm. little things like that. But somehow I kept busy. Sometimes I probably was just drawn for myself, but uh, I would do it. But it would it would make a difference. There was sometimes uh, everybody wanted to be in on what the cars were, as they do it now. They have the whole wall filled with you mm-hmm. know cars for sports cars, uh, hot rods, uh, foreign cars, blah blah blah. And they're making so many cars. I mean, they're making over a hundred castings now. So mm-hmm. this wall full of drawings and ideas pinning pinned up on the wall. So everybody knows what they got to do and when they got to do it. There's a schedule mm-hmm. of everything. So it's completely different. Um, mm-hmm. Things change as time goes along. So like if you're you're like at one point you talked about uh, in a previous interview, I, I saw you, you had to do like the gas crisis cars, the poison Pinto <laughs> and the Gremlin X and stuff like that. So so are you you're just going, OK, well, we're going to do these. And do, do you then have to pick up the phone and call AMC and go, hey, can I make a Gremlin or are you just doing it? We had a l- licensing department um, that would do that part of it. And in the, in the very beginning, nobody cared. There was not. Nobody cared about, you could do all the Fords you want or Chevys or anything. I actually don't remember doing any anything that somebody came and said, hey, you can't do that. My first real thing that got licensing was I worked on Billy Gibbons' uh, Eliminator Coop. I mm-hmm. did some drawings for him. I did the side scoop. And actually, he asked me to put two Zs on the side. And I said, no, I'm not going to wreck this car with two Zs on the <laughs> side. It was perfect and just a red car. It was gorgeous. And uh, somebody else put the Z's on the side, and 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 I didn't know who Billy Gibbons was. He was just a car, the guy that wanted a car. So I did the thirty-four three window, and I said I'm going to do Billy's car. So I did the the two Z's on the side, did a red car, and I thought, ah, he'll get a kick out of this. Well, when it came out, we found out they have lawyers. He's got lawyers, and boy, they always get they, always get they lawyers. Came in, and somewhere I've got my letter that uh, says we found the offender that did that, and we'll we'll punish him or something so wow. if I'm not, i had to go, every drawing i ever did i had to go through legal and make sure everything was it was okay by them mm-hmm. so and then it ended up with the legal department so big that it was as big as the design department because they had to deal mostly when did nascar you can imagine every detail oh, sure. oh, unbelievable it was mm-hmm. it was it was really something because every the signatures and the pages of all the legal stuff they had to do with every one of them so mm-hmm. it was really something but yeah there were plenty of times where i couldn't do a certain logo on the side of a car there's a lot of talk about all the good times at mattel and we just talked about some of the rough times but what like when it comes to like designing things or some of your projects that you had what was the most challenging project that you ever worked on something that comes to your mind that was just like it it was really tough to get through is there any kind of like a design or a car or project that really was challenging for you in your career? Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of my favorite cars. In fact, my favorite, probably my favorite car. Um, I remember we were brainstorming one time and uh, 
my boy, somebody came up with the idea, let's make a car sound. And we all went, yeah, right. Room, room. What are we going to do? And of course, we kicked it around. He he said, no, no, we're going to do it. What do we do? So I remember working on it and trying to figure out what to do and everything. And it was the uh, Legend of Life Snake. Okay. Remember, know that one at all? The the Legend of Life Snake funny car that lifts, the, the body lifts up, the exhaust. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. The lower belt moves, the yep. Christmas tree rolls down. None of that is digital. It's all mechanical. It's all little That's amazing. things that push the body up or make the make the lights flash. And <laughs> that sounds exhaust. super challenging. Oh, my God. Oh, it was great, man. And then when it was all done, if you look in the background, I'm in the background in the, and put my, my face in the Crying. background. It was spectators, <laughs> then I had to go out and find the actual uh, the announcer that announced it, Lions, and I had him actually talk well, for Dome. He's warming up his tires, blah blah blah. And uh, even now, that's my my biggest challenge and my favorite Hot Wheel of all times. Yeah, you have that one in your collection. Yeah, I got it. It wears okay. batteries out so fast. I never. It doesn't work. <laughs> it sucks right through them. Right. It uses, and it's got a cassette in it. Oh, that's amazing. really that's the sound comes up. No digital. It was a cassette that turned. You had to turn it back when you were done. Oh, wow. The good old days. Yeah. It wasn't <laughs> yeah. so easy. No, it <laughs> like wasn't. It is but, nowadays. You know, when that, when, when that thing works, it's mind blowing. It's great. Yeah. I saw, I, in fact, I t- talked to Perdome just recently and the same thing as he says, still remembers it. Wow. That's really that's cool fantastic. Story. Yeah. yeah, that's uh one of my bucket list collectors items I want to acquire someday. I've I've watched footage of that thing probably five or six times in a row, just going, How did they do that? That's so cool. And the 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 little lights firing up for the the, the exhaust pipes, uh yeah. so cool. Yeah. I, I had no idea it was a mechanical yeah, tape. Mechanical. That's, yeah, that's all. I thought yeah. it was at least a microchip. No, that's amazing. Yeah. No, it's uh, if you ever get one and you it's not working or something or you don't care, take it apart and look at all the cool stuff inside. Little motors that push things up and oh, sure. parts that move and wheels that spin and everything. Mm-hmm. Great little product. Larry, is it really is cool. it true that you turned down every promotion they threw at you so that you could just keep designing cars? Let's put it this way. Um, luckily, my the big boss of design back in the sixties realize that guys like me and designers for Martell and everything else were better on the board mm-hmm. than going up the ladder. So he call, he did a thing he called the double ladder, which designers and creative people could go up marketing and everything. Um, and <laughs> after being there uh, 40, 50 years, they ran out of names for me. Uh, they <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. couldn't figure out what, what, after a while, you got to give somebody a, a new name. And uh, I can't remember the last couple of ones, a uh, super principal or something. Like we'll never go. Nobody <laughs> will ever get that again. Admiral. Larry, Admiral, Admiral, Larry Wood. Yeah. Op Prime. Yeah. All I right. should go back to all my business cards and see what I was named all those years. Well, what I what I did like out of the, the idea that that story was true was that you didn't want to kind of get bogged down with all the HR managerial stuff. That, that just doesn't seem like that would really tick any boxes with you. You know, I, I one time somebody asked me if I'd do something like that. And I said, the first thing I'd do, I'd fire myself. Because if I'm not drawing cars, I'm not doing any good for Mattel. Mm-hmm. So why would you make me do that and hire somebody to, to draw cars? Didn't yeah. make sense. At least it feels like... uh they were trying to give you affirmation in some sort, whether it's some quasi title or not, or not. But that, that's right, good. As long as, they, as long as they paid me, that's all. Yeah, that's I, right. As long as that check every two yeah, weeks came, yeah, we're yeah. good. I've got to ask my selfish question here because literally one of my favorite toys growing up, and still to this day, was the crack up set. And oh, I, I just absolutely like the it. It sent me down an entire path. Like I build almost he all. Talks my... Talks about it a lot. Larry. I talk about uh, it a lot, a but lot. I, I also like <laughs> like all the model cars I build now are weathered and damaged and stuff. And it, it all kind of goes back to that set because that was the first time I saw a car could be wrecked or uh, like a toy could be something that's not pristine. And I I would love to know the story behind the crack up series and and how that came to pass. Well, basically. There was a department that was in charge of, it was called Prelim, and they came up with crazy ideas. A perfect idea uh, concept was uh, Sizzlers. Mm-hmm. They had a little 
little chassis with a huge battery on it and it would run around. And they said, that's it. And I said, I can't design around that huge battery. So they would do the research and they would find a little tiny battery that would fit and, and everything would, then I'd have to design around that. But that was their job. Freelim was the idea for concept. A lot of stuff came in from, everything came in from them actually. So then they came to me with the, they had a, a probably a 24 scale model that did the turn and the whatever parts moved and said, we're going to do a series of crash cars. Well, basically it was up to me to design the car and figure out how it was going to work after that point. But uh, yeah, it was a fun project because that's what kids do. They crash the sure. cars in each other and, and, and making the front ends work. The little hood would pop up and release the grill that would swing around. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, that was, that was a fun project. Uh, it's it's a, a very elegant design too, because like I've taken them apart, because that's the kind of guy I am, and and to have it all be latches and and one spring and be able to do all that with just like one spring and a little latch, and then there were like the the flip outs that kind of came after that, and um, I know the the Crasher series kind of was like a, a follow up to that as well. I got that crack up set christmas morning i think it was like 1985 or 86 and uh i was just like wait a second the track is designed so you can crash into each other this is amazing yeah. like it was just like this is the the best thing my little demented mind could could think of and uh <laughs> still to this day i still have all those and uh, i've picked up i've got one of each i don't have every iteration but i've got one of each of the bodies Okay. And yeah. uh, they're they're great. I love the they're truck cool. one. the The truck the the p- pickup truck is, I think, my favorite one because it's a, a double action kind of thing with that flip up. And I actually got one that still has the the cab <laughs> on it because those things would wear out because you you do them so many times and the plastic can only flex so many times. But they're still what a what a brilliant design to to put those kind of things in a car that small was always just so cool for me. And I, well, I love the detail along with, uh, w- along with any other hot wheel, the biggest problem was cost. You know I mean? We could have made those a heck of a lot cooler, but you had to make them for yeah. you know, over a dollar. So you kept trying to, trying to save a buck here or there, or trying to the weight of the die cast had to be so much and everything else. And it's the same now. They're still just about a dollar pr- price. Yeah. And that's why you see a lot of plastic in them now, because they're just having to read that, read, uh, trying to meet that price with a, almost the yeah. same price was meant what 65 years ago. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yep. But it's it's such a, a universal beloved toy. In fact, that's why Mark here has a, a, a charity called Driven Dreams, where we're we're raising twenty thousand uh, diecast cars for for kids in need. Because that it's still such a a universally beloved toy. You can give it to a boy, mm-hmm. a girl. It doesn't matter. There's a we always joke. There's a a diecast for everyone. I took a friend of mine and his wife uh, to a flea market. We were digging through diecast here. She was curious and he wanted to tag along and she's like i don't like cars I don't. and then she found one that was a little taco car and she's like i love tacos i've got to get this car and i was like see huh you thought gotcha. you didn't like cars uh, my daughter loves there's a one that's a purple cupcake and she she loves that one yeah so we did all sorts in fact i remember doing all these cars that i wanted to do and then one year i said to myself wait a minute i'm supposed to be doing these for kids not for me so the shark and the <laughs> snake and the yeah. di- two engine uh, all the uh, the crazy animal cars because i kept thinking mm. well wait we're supposed to be doing these for kids um in real life i was doing them for myself but mm. once in a while we thought about kids well going off that uh our the the charity that i started originally started as hot wheels for hope but i changed the name because i foresaw legal <laughs> we talked about legal aspects <laughs> yeah exactly so i was like yeah um i better change the name uh so we changed it this this year and um i just wanted to basically thank you for sticking with it and making all the things that you you did and inspiring so many other people because um some the the number one thing that i'm passionate about is getting um hot wheels and die cast cars in general to um, kids that are uh, sick and less fortunate is, is our number one goal. So this year, I think we're sitting at um, approaching 13,000 cars donated worldwide to kids um, that are in need. And well, it, it's, it's life changing for kids. It really yeah, is. I got a suggestion for you because I was going to do this and I just got so busy to do it at the hot wheel convention. I've always wanted to put a, uh, Put a box near the elevator and say, this is for charity. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Got any mm-hmm. any cars you don't want? This is all going to go to a charity. To drop it in here, and as they're leaving the hotel, they got dozens of cars that they can't even sell for a dollar. Mm-hmm. And you would just we should talk about that for uh, Atlanta yeah. this this spring. I'm hoping to yeah. be there. So, yeah, you know, that's the, I mean I I'll try to make that. Um, the yeah. the one thing I thought about is something similar to that, setting up boxes at uh, um, grocery stores and stuff like that, to where people can can buy stuff and drop them off in the boxes, and they're sealed and they're locked, and and um, people can do their part. Um, I'd like it to grow into. I mean, I think we're we're shooting for twenty thousand cars this year worldwide, but my goal is two hundred fifty thousand cars, a million cars donated. Yeah. It's like it could kids. easily be happening. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because you think about how many collectors there are of diecast cars in general, just the Hot Wheels alone. It, it's it's dumb how many there are. If Plus one person like the, donates they, one car, that's millions yeah, well, of cars. They also they buy the case to get one car. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, if, yeah. And we're we've all been guilty of that. I think big... we've all been yeah. guilty of that. Yeah, of buying yeah, a case of seventy two and then buying, yeah. finding the couple cars we want. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And then the rest go to the kids and they don't care. They don't care about super treasure yeah. hunts or treasure hunts. Exactly. Yeah. There's there's actually a, a really interesting article that I read about the, the psychology of toy cars and how it's such a universal thing because they're freewheeling and because they are a self-contained toy, they don't need anything else. They don't need batteries. They don't need fuel they don't need an accessory they are the toy and you can put it in your pocket and you can take it anywhere and it's just the the portableness and the simpleness it's it, it just makes sense that this is uh the beloved toy that it is because cars are universal everybody has a car related story everybody has an emotion related to a car good bad and different whatever even if it's just oh this car looks like a taco and i love tacos uh it, it, doesn't love it, tacos. Prover- it, prover- it provokes a reaction but it also has there's nostalgia and comfort to them like david said it's it's crazy to think of a world where there isn't a hot wheels or there isn't this kind of toy not just hot wheels but just 164 scale cars in general beloved toy it's just kind of wild to think that there was a time when that was uh ever in doubt can i can i piggyback but, off that because yeah. larry I, larry don't get a big head here all right so uh zoom in you were just inducted into the automotive hall of fame 2023 inductee and viewers that's not the uh diecast hall of fame that was back in 09 original class inductee this is the automotive industry hall of fame for uh for the legacy that you have uh left on the entire industry and when we talk about like a world without hot wheels um thankfully we don't have to worry about that you you ensured that but i'm curious to know with your legacy in the diecast industry specifically what would you tell other diecast makers and designers today what is words from the master to keep the hobby growing you know what it was it was a passion thing i was a car freak i got to work on a different car every day it was just my you know it was meant to be uh for those guys it it has to be the same thing you have to uh, enjoy what you're doing you have to know the car um one of my favorite things was always doing the chassis because i always wanted a kid to say dad what's that that's a muffler or that's a exhaust system or something under the car and uh, being a car nut i knew what what i had to put under there and i feel like the designers sometimes forget about that part of it but that's the that's getting into the details the little little parts that the kid can really enjoy and look at close and i used to put in dogs in the interior or uh, wrenches mm-hmm. and something on the interiors mm-hmm. kids could like look at it more than once and really enjoy it so uh basically it's got to be a passion you gotta you gotta love what you're doing because you're doing it for basically for yourself and just luckily everybody else cared about it don't touch the dial diecast breakdown will be right back after these messages this episode of diecast breakdown is brought to you by you that's right 
We are 100% viewer and listener supported, and we are so grateful for those of you who have already supported the podcast and the shows we're planning to add to the Diecast Media Network family. You can find out more about how to support this project by visiting diecastmedianetwork.com or email us about sponsoring an episode at diecastbreakdown at gmail.com. Hello, this is Diecast Dude from the Netherlands, and you are watching Diecast Breakdown. This presentation of Diecast Breakdown is brought to you by Twice Diecast and Dots and Man Diecast on YouTube. Please visit their links in the show notes and subscribe to their channels for more epic Diecast content. Hey, this is Champion DJK, and you're watching Diecast Breakdown. And now, the thrilling conclusion of this week's episode of Diecast Breakdown. Larry, have you ever thought about the the fact that billions of people on this planet have held something that you designed? There's not a, a long list in history of people that have had that kind of impact or touch into other people's lives. Well, that's a thought. I hadn't thought about that, but in making uh, millions a week, a uh, perfect example is when I put my phone number on that tow truck. I forgot we were making millions a week. And yeah, the phone you, started, you rem phone remembered real started, quick. <laughs> yeah, it started coming in, you know, and the, I didn't put an area code on it. So it was all over the United States. And of course, people were calling Mattel saying, get that phone number off. So, um, yeah. We 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 got in trouble for that one, but it was <laughs> little did I know it would become a legend. You had like a a red Mattel phone, right? Like just like the president's phone. You're like yeah. the, the bat. It's like, like oh, had, the bat had phone. A cord, had a phone with a cord on it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Good old. Well, who is this? Yeah, yeah. It's fluffy. What's up, fluffy? All right, uh, we got a question from uh, Justin Ellis, my brother, who does a lot of the designs here. He's a designer as well, and he wanted to know. Uh, where do you draw inspiration from when it comes to your designs and how do you go about developing a design when you're sitting there staring at a blank piece of paper? What do you do? Well, it was pretty easy in the beginning could be in a car nut, mm -hmm. uh, going to car, car shows every weekend, hot rod magazines. That's so this was before car stuff was on TV. So it was basically, you had to, you had to go do your research for what you were looking for. But, um, yeah, it was, for me, it was easy. It was no problem coming up with something, uh, I got to admit, I probably threw away some good designs as I was going along, but uh, you, you just did what you had to do for that that period of time. The guys now are doing a fabulous job, though. You got to admit the stuff that's mm -hmm. coming out now. They're killer. Unbelievable. <laughs> just in the graphics they're putting in that it's funny because I did the graphics up to a certain point. And I remember one marketing person came down to me one time and said, I don't want to see another set of flames or stripes you got to do something else like, <laughs> how else is there got the graphics guys in and they just went nuts those guys got clowns on the cars and all sorts of stuff mm -hmm. and that was a big it was a big step when that happened the graphics took off and the, and the cars became pieces of art in some cases you could do the same car five or six times and and, and they, each one was a just a piece of art so things changed when that happened and that was pretty cool I still enjoy doing some of the graphics. I'd sneak a graphic thing in there once in a while on my own, say, hey, can you do this for me and, and get it in there? But that was a, a complete, we had a, like five guys doing graphics alone with uh, because of all the models we were making. This is a tough question, Larry. So just um, it's going to re require some brain power here. I don't know if it's too late over there where you're at. but um, So if you could pick one Hot Wheel to... Ooh. The uh, car mm. to represent your entire career. Ooh. What would that be? What was the most in instrumental car that you designed, or that your most pat? You like a passion project? It, it goes back to the other question I asked you about challenging, but this one's a little bit different. To where it's it's the most. It defines your most of your career. Well, uh, I'll, it's funny you said passion because. Mm -hmm. The passion was a car I did to prove there were collectors because it didn't go on the track. Mm -hmm. It had wheels inside the inside the, the skirts, and so it was not a car that was working on a track. And I said, "Let's try this and see what happens." Mm -hmm. And that would broke all the rules, and yet it sold like crazy. And as far as I was concerned, that's the car that that told us we could do uh, start off whatever, on the whatever thing. you want. <laughs> yeah, and the collector thing, I luckily got to do that for the last few years I was there with all the uh, all the special you know, high-end collector stuff with all the parts on them. And boy, that was the fun part. But 
the the passion is probably one of the, one of the ones that I feel uh, that I it helped everything break loose and go into the collector market rather than make we were still making kid toys but you had to think right. about hey yeah. would, a, would a car guy really like this car so uh, it it made a big difference and believe yeah, I, me and believe yeah. me we still tried to put them down the track I had the original purple passion and I still exactly. tried to put it, but yeah. oh sure. It was. It's a gorgeous car. It's. It's one of my favorites as well. Yeah. It's funny because now that I look at it, I realize it doesn't look very accurate on a forty nine Merc, which I did a better. The the one twenty fourth was a beautiful, accurate car. Mm. But at the time, it was just a, a takeoff. It was a toy. A takeoff mm. on a, a chop Merc. And like I say, it uh, as far as I was concerned, that's the one that told us we can we can make stuff for collectors and let's keep going on this line. Yeah, it's. It's one of those things to where it's like you, the the industry, like the all the cars are so vast that you can go back to your childhood with those crack up cars. And I had a, a crash test dummy cars that uh, split into two pieces that I brings me right back to a specific moment in my childhood. So it's the nostalgia feel. And then you, you grow to pro- progress to some of the nicer cars that have all the little details and stuff as you get older, but they all bring you the similar amount of joy. I mean, I had the Baja Breakers, one of my first five, my first Hot Wheels that I had. And I recently, I found one online that was new in the card and I probably would have paid whatever they were asking, but I ended up getting it for little 20 bucks or something like that. But yeah, so it's, it's those kind of cars that it's just that from your childhood to when you're older, a lot of these diecast cars are what got me into the real cars. So it's it's a really cool thing. And I think anybody that loves one-to-one cars will always appreciate Hot Wheels. I, I, I try to hand them out whenever I can. I just went on a, a couple day vacation and I gave one to the valet driver or the valet person for my car. And I was like, Hey, do you like Hot Wheels? Like, and he's like, "Well, I don't really collect them, but my son will love these." And I gave him four or five cars, and he's like, going to be a hero when he goes home and hands him his kids some Hot Wheels." So it's just one of those things. Go back, goes back to to kids, and then goes all the way up to adults, and kind of creates who we are as yeah. as full size car it, collectors. It's, it's funny how some cars click, and some cars are just they're okay, but they don't click, and yet they're cool cars. Mm-hmm. A perfect example is we all know the Bone Shaker. I mean, come oh, on, yeah. what the hell? Yeah. I was, I was, uh, I was drawing, I was drawing a Model T hot rod, no big deal. And I was going through some research, and I picked up a biker magazine, and they had skulls on the gas tanks and skulls on. It. So, yeah, what the hell? I'll just put a skull, a skull on this Why thing. Why it was not? just going to be another car. <laughs> Man, oh man, do I sign a lot of Hot Wheels and a lot of Bone Shakers, and there's no place to sign on them. So, mm, yeah, <laughs> if they're in yeah. the package, I'm okay. But if they say, "Hey, would you sign my Bone Shaker?" It's like, what the hell am I gonna sign? L, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, on the on the hood between the intakes, there's yeah. not much space there. Yeah, those are but those are those are the cars that we all love. Those hot rods. I mean, I we all love hot rods, especially those little tea bucket type of hot rods. Yeah, really that's cool. what it was. Death traps. Yeah. Rat rods were coming in and everything was going in that direction. And I, it was an mm-hmm. easy car to draw. In fact, I, I, my story is I threw the original drawing away because it was just the Model T. No big deal. It wouldn't have anything. And then I got this idea with the skull and I pulled the drawing back out of the trash and thought, ah, what if I did this and did this? Mm-hmm. So you never know. One idea will, will strike them. And, and they've gone through the buses. Everybody collected the buses for a while and the dairy delivery for a while. So it goes, there's different ones going on. And you're right about the, the Japanese cars. At the Hot Wheel convention, there were guys on either side of me and they were the young designers with their all their cars laid out there. And man, people were going over there. Oh, look at this! Look at this! And I'm going, it's a Japanese car. What are you still looking at? So yeah, like, I'm still, I'm, I'm strictly yeah. old school. So it's but uh, it's, some of those I've, Japanese cars go way back. Like yeah, you know, the Skylines they started in like the 20s or something like that. Sure. It was sure. It, it, people don't realize those cars. They weren't muscle cars. They weren't sports cars. They were like Model Ts type of stuff. But over in Japan, so. It's well, a lot cool. of it has to do with a, a young kid figuring out what he can afford and what he wants, what he sees. You don't see a hot rod every day. You can't afford no. a hot rod. 
So you buy a, a 510 back in the day for yeah, 500 bucks, thousand dollars, 500 hours, yeah. and you work on it. It's like me. I started with a hot rod. I found a $25 hot rod a body and I started putting it, parts in it. And that was the thing I could afford. So I, it stuck with me. The car companies should actually make a car to get kids into it. Affordable, right like cheap. Then, yeah. Then yeah. you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're that you're loyal to that car from then on. You, you, sure. you know, sure. Talk Entry level yeah, car is like, not really a thing anymore. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. I, I think, uh, guys, I think Saturn did that back in the nineties, and I'm still loyal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> can't win them David's all. always plugging yeah. his Saturn SL. I think yeah. SL one or just SL, right? Just so, just SL. Yeah. Base seventy nine ninety nine off hey, the lot. Pretty, hey, he's pretty bitter the car about for the time. Not making it. That's right. Yeah, hey, yeah. Larry, Larry, think back to your the fan mail or the the feedback that you got when you were uh, just in the zone, killing it. What are some of the more creative or maybe the most creative uh, piece of feedback that you got, like fan mail, like people using your car or uh, just really interesting feedback you got on a particular project? Anything well, jump out? No, not, nothing really jumps out as, as far as uh, everybody thinking it was the world's best car. But at conventions, when the conventions started, that's when you got feedback. Just the guy on the street would, would say it was his favorite car, but that was one guy. But when you get to the conventions and uh, people are lined up because you're, you've are you got a drawing with a bone shaker on it, it, it's a big thing. It's a real compliment. It proves that they're looking for that, that one car. Um, so I think that's really the only place where I got a, a, a feedback of a lot of people. I mean, again, I got car guys that like certain hot rods and stuff but yeah that was the big feedback when we started and it, and again mike strauss with the with the value guide i think that had a lot to do with it because a lot of people as far as they're concerned i've got this toy because it's worth this much money or i've got this toy and you don't that's kind of the the, at the convention that's kind of you get a lot of that I, i've got it and you don't which is cool because it, it makes people dig for that car that's got the wrong wheels on it or it's got a different color on it or something like that. And it drives people nuts, but it's, it's really neat. People come to me all the time and say, did you see this car? I mean, they, they ask me, is this the right color on this car? I just draw them. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know what color they made. Is it faded? I don't know. It's, yeah. it, it's the way we made them. And as far as I was concerned, I was on the, I was 10 cars after that. By the time I realized that car was going to come out in that blue, I'm not the, that kind of collector. I, I, I just, I like the stuff that was fun to doing not not the production stuff yeah that's funny brendan said kind of the same thing when he was on the show uh that people will ask him about the variants on the hot wheels and he's just like yeah i'm, I'm just like, strong I um <laughs> <laughs> i i don't handle that i'm not over there in malaysia making these things exactly. um, but yeah so um I, I just from that from the conventions and stuff um when that change happened, when you said that people started buying the cars for themselves, did that surprise you? Did the adult collector transition catch you off guard at all? Uh, probably a little bit. Uh, again, we were supposed to be designing for kids, but I was designing for myself. So I was mm. trying to make the cars accurate and put all the little fun stuff in them and everything. So as far as I was concerned, I enjoyed them. So why wouldn't somebody else my age enjoy them? But uh, again, I never thought anybody would actually collect thousands of them right. <laughs> these days is the collections at the convention one guy had a room and he had like every color of every car from the 60s just rows and rows of every wow. every car and every color and it was like wow I didn't we know, know we you know. know guys with shipping containers full exactly of yeah. cars it's that's crazy some people get really i think we all get we've all gotten carried away at yeah. one point in our collection. Thank goodness. What, what, yeah. We've had, Mark didn't mention this, but we we have one of our anonymous contributors to the Diecast Day of Giving gave 3,000 cars out of his collection that are in package wow. that he's donating. Yeah, really? 3,000. There's a lot of other people that were at five, six, seven, eight hundred cars of their own collection. And these are not cars that they went out and bought. These are cars that were already in their house. Sure. And we're like, yeah, I can, I can let go of 3000 cars. That's well, incredible. Yeah. Again, I think at the convention, we could easily get that number in a matter of minutes because 
when they leave, they just got all these cars they didn't sell, and they got to pack know. them up. Yeah, they don't want to bring. Yeah, them you home. can you can help me be this Gestapo at the exit, uh, Larry. I think we could, <laughs> that's going to be the yeah. problem. Trying to keep everybody out of the boxes. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's right. That's, that's the right. thing is people are going to be can, digging. Yeah, no, yeah, we'll have to have a little. Can, Little Leave little slot down, so you can't yeah. see what Nail cars box. are in there. Yeah, <laughs> no, that's that's, good, that's what it would yeah. be. It would be like a solid box that you you know once you put it in, that's you ain't it. in the back, and you don't know how many are in there. So. Yeah, who no, knows? that's mm-hmm. yeah. We mark. would love to do that at the Atlanta show. We're actually actively yeah. planning to be at the Atlanta show. So okay, uh, I'll uh, yeah. mention it to Mark and Jennifer and see if there's a way we can do that. They wouldn't have mm-hmm. to do anything. It'd be us. We'd just come yeah. up. Yeah. With We'll we'll now. even bring the box. We'll, yep. we'll yeah. Exactly. I'll try to get like somebody like Mr. T or something like that for for bodyguard or security, or maybe the Rock yeah, so, or something like that. You, you, so, you, 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 Ch- Larry, Larry <laughs> Chuck will buy you two hamburgers and one hot dog at the bar city. <laughs> he'll he'll put that four dollars and fifty cents on your on you for you. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well. Well. Uh, Larry, it's been an absolute delight talking to you. Uh, as we're wrapping things up, this is a question that I always love asking people that have been interviewed a thousand times. Um, what is the question that you wish people would ask you on an interview? Good point. Uh, what are you doing now? Huh? That's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a good question. What is a good what question? Are you doing? What are you doing now? What are you doing now? And there it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that recently. That's <laughs> nice. So we'll design. It's a... It's a bone shaker. I added a toe. The toe shaker. On. I got you. Toe and shaker. It's yeah. got a phone number on it. It does have it, a phone number. This is the um, chase car. It had a phone number on it. So <laughs> it, we, it was like one out of every 10 was a chase car. So this this is the one with the phone number. Does it got a different phone number? Nope. Same phone number. Oh, well, there Larry, you go, where, folks. Still, Larry, where still my you, phone. Where can you find those at? Sold out at the convention. Sold I didn't, out. Ad, didn't advertise, didn't put a sign anywhere, just opened up the door, and all of a sudden people started walking in. And uh, so I'm hoping to make one for the new the convention in uh, Atlanta. Okay. Atlanta. All like right, guys. Make, yeah, make your plans, people. Yep. We're Get starting to think about the second one. The There's first one was just an experiment just to see if, what would happen. Yeah. And, um, so that was fun. I mean, I work on my cars all day, of course, but this was kind of fun to get back into the business. And it's it was it was fun. Love it. Oh well, yeah. set aside three for us because uh, <laughs> uh, that is that is too cool. Even though you're doing the one one to one cars, you're still uh, one sixty four is still in the blood. Well, I again, I hadn't done anything in for what ten years, twelve years, something like that, and I was watching other guys use my name. I was said, okay, you, you can use my name, and then I started adding up the numbers and said, wait a minute, why don't I do yeah. my own car? Yeah, so, right. uh, I figured I'd give it a try. Are those things that you are? Are you customizing them yourself, or do you have a, a manufacturer? Got a couple people helping out because I don't do S, uh, SLA stuff. I just design it, and they they make the parts, and we put it together. Another guy does the package and put it together. So, awesome. you know, I just organize it. Well, that is something I will uh, make a note of for my trip to Atlanta. I'd like to hear some more from your your cat, though, Larry. Next time, we'd yeah, like fluffy, to, yeah, fluffy, we need more fluffy. Say. Yeah, yeah, fluffy will give more you a, a good. Interview. He was oh, my yeah. cat at the shop, and he was. Uh, I got like a dozen cats down there, and Fluffy would come yeah. in and get petted. He knew what he was doing, so he got yeah. sick one day. So I brought him home, and he's been the the cat. And the funny thing about Fluffy, if in one of the pictures I sent you, it was a cat on the hot rod. And, yep. and uh, anytime somebody brings a camera, does an interview, he'll jump up on the cars and come <laughs> over, stand there and just pose. <laughs> this, hey, this was his plan all along. Yeah, he exactly. got you. Yeah, he knew yeah, he was his playing the long con. I'm oh. sticking with this guy. I'm getting fed. <laughs> I, I, I yeah. think all the all the best garages have a shop cat. I had yep. I had my guy Gravy was his name, and he'd sit with me while I would. He sit for hours inside the Valiant while I was working on it, and just chilled out. You're just yeah, somebody to somebody to talk to that doesn't talk back. Exactly. Yeah. He was a good cat. I miss him a lot. Well, uh, thank you again, Larry, and thank you, listeners, watchers, wherever you are, for making it to the end of another episode. We're so grateful that you stuck around. And uh, again, thank you to the people who support this show. The, if you want to do that, you can absolutely visit diecastbreakdown.com or click the little join button down below this if you're watching on YouTube. And again, please share the show. That's the best way you can really help us out and uh, spread the word about the show and 
uh, bring more people in and we're going to have more great interviews like Larry and a lot of really cool designers coming up again real soon. So as always, we want to thank you for coming along with us for the ride. So until next time, thanks guys. Stay fresh. Thanks for listening to Diecast Breakdown. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts and tell a friend to listen in. Find Diecast Breakdown on your favorite social media platforms or visit diecastmedianetwork.com to learn more about this and our other projects. Diecast Breakdown is a presentation of Flying Valiant and the Diecast Media Network.